Today's video is sponsored by the Finnish company LoopDeck, the people behind the amazing LoopDeck Live. Welcome to the Sim Hanger. My name's Mark. Thanks for watching and let's get started. The LoopDeck Live, what is that? Is that your autopilot? Your GPS? Your Garmin 430? Well, it can be all of those and more. So just what exactly is the LoopDeck Live? Well, it's this a device originally designed to help with productivity for those involved in media production, content creators, streamers and the like. But at its heart, it's a programmable device. It's a bit like a stream deck, but a stream deck on steroids. In addition to the 12 LED buttons in the center, which each have haptic feedback, it can also function as a touch panel so you can flick from one page to the next. It has six high resolution rotary dials which also operate as buttons as well by simply pressing them in and a row of programmable buttons along the base. The quality is good, it feels sturdy and durable and from a size point of view well it appeals to me. It's ideal for control of something like your Garmin unit or maybe your autopilot in your flight sim. And that's exactly what we're going to be having a look at today. We're going to whip through the preliminaries fairly quickly so we can get to the more interesting stuff. Suffice to say it comes very adequately packed. Quality of the packaging matching the quality of the product. You get the device itself, the quick start guide, stand, USB-C connector, and USB 2 adapter. The Loop Deck Live itself only has one port. It's a USB Type-C connector. It also comes with a simple stand that'll hold the product up at about 40-45 degrees on your desktop. The stand clicks firmly to the unit. I do feel that the supplied cable is a little bit short. It's USB-C to USB-C connector. One end is 90 degrees, which is ideal for connecting to the unit. If you don't have a spare USB-C port, there is an adapter supplied to a standard USB. It's what I used as I connected it to my hub. And that's it. Simple and straightforward. The quick start guide will direct you to the website where you'll download the appropriate software, either Windows or Mac OS. I'm using Windows. The download's not a particularly large file, so it's done fairly quickly. The install is an equally quick affair. There's a very brief introductory tour. It automatically checks if there's any firmware updates required and it's recommended that you log in and create an account with LoopDeck to ensure you can keep the device up to date. When we first start the software, this is what we see with the unit plugged in. The main profile is shown in the top bar. It's a Windows default profile with a number of functions and assignments already made. Whatever we see on screen, the LoopDeck physically represents that and vice versa. Here we're changing pages and it reflects on screen and on the Loop Deck Live as well. The software and basic configuration concepts are easy to use once you understand how it works. You will need to spend a little bit of time getting familiar with the interface and the functions. If you do that, it will be time well spent. I'm going to quickly run through the basics but it is well beyond the scope of this video to cover all aspects. At its most basic, on the right hand side, you have your menu selection of assignable actions and functions. These are then either assigned or drag and dropped to the selected rotary switch, button or dial on the main device itself. Those changes are applicable to whatever profile you happen to be on. The software comes with a Windows default profile. And the right hand menu also comes with a number of pre-configured applications. By selecting the slider icon we can see what they are. We can tidy up this menu by selecting those we don't use and turning them off. I'll keep OBS because I use that. Now I'll keep the MIDI function and we'll be explaining that a little later on. Some items can't be deleted. Selecting the loop deck icon brings up the loop deck actions. This allows you to do such things as selecting an application to open, assigning it to a button, on the Loop Deck Live, etc. The next icon on the menu is the OS or operating system. 
and from here you can select a wide range of pre-configured Windows actions. The next icon is specific loop deck actions, such as activating touch. This is our MIDI option, and as mentioned before, we'll be covering that in more detail later on. And these, for example, are pre-assigned actions available for the OBS application. So you could, for example, have a combination of loop deck, OBS, and system functions on one page. Turning to the menus on the top bar, first we'll have a look at Workspace. This is something you probably won't use very often. For flight simming, it allows you to categorize various actions and functions. The Device tab shows us which device is active. In my case, I only have the Loop Deck Live, but this would be useful if you had other Loop Deck products. But the one we're really interested in and use most often is Profiles. Under Application Profiles, it has Dynamic Mode, and you can click this on or off. On means when that application starts, the profile will automatically switch to that application's profile. Depending what you have loaded on your system, once again you can clean up this menu and only have those items that are active. This is done by clicking on the three dots on the application profiles and unchecking the items you don't require. Again, this will make future navigation easier. Once again, these application profiles are default and come with the system. Here you also have the option to import a profile you previously saved or downloaded, and an option to search Loop Deck to find more application profiles. We could select that option, or alternatively, in the top right hand corner we can select Marketplace. The Marketplace gives us a wide variety of profiles, plugins, icon packs, and so on. Some are free and some are payware. And we'll be looking at the Microsoft Flight Simulator plugin shortly. Let's now have a look at the basics of how we use the software. We're currently on the default main Windows profile. For the main profile or applications, if we click on the three dots, we're given the option to add a profile. And we can add an empty profile or the default one. This will simply be a duplicate of what's already loaded. You can also delete profiles here. For now, I'll stay with the default profile. And let's do some config changes. And to do this, we look to the right-hand menu. From here, we can select the category that we want. I'm going to choose the OS, the Windows functions. The actions are helpfully held in folders. I can select the appropriate folder. In this case, for, as an example, I'm using Media. And here are all the pre-configured actions. I'm currently searching all functions. I can change this by selecting dial only, for example. This will only show dial functions, and we can see there's only one available. These are only button press actions. Selecting both gives me all options. Let's say, for example, I want to change the button assignments. If I go to one already assigned, this is Lock Workstation. Move my mouse to bring up the menu and click Unassign. And now that button's clear. It's no longer assigned to the Loop Deck Live, but that action remains selectable from the right-hand menu. I can clear rotary dial functions as shown. This dial now is unassigned. Turning it on the Loop Deck Live will mean no action is taken. Let's now reassign volume up. Remember, the rotary dials are also buttons, so it could be assigned here, but I want to assign it to one of the LED buttons. There it is, volume up. If I try and assign a rotary function, volume level for example, to a button, well it won't work. It won't accept it. If on the other hand I move it to the rotary dial, this of course will be accepted, as shown on screen. I'll just delete these quickly, I don't want the duplicate function. I'm now going to assign the button press volume down, select it from the right hand menu, and drop it into the appropriate place. I now have buttons for volume up and volume down. If I place it over another button, it will overwrite that function. As mentioned previously, we can mix and match different functions. They don't all have to be Windows functions, for example. I'm just clearing another two buttons to give me a bit more space here. I'm going to select Loop Deck Functions and Open Application. Config options open in the lower portion. First, I'm going to select the application. This by default is looking at the desktop. Otherwise, you'd use the Run command. In this example, I've selected my benchmarking software 3D Mark. If I want to, I can change the icon, search on my computer for a suitable image, or go to the icon library. 
These are some icons I'd previously set up. There are a number of default options available, including the keyboard layout and also the default loop deck icons. You can, of course, create your own. Simply a JPEG. In this example, I'm just going to select any icon. I think that will do. Hit OK. Then Save. Give that action a name. I'll call it 3D Mark. And Save. And we can see the button press above has been saved. I can now allocate that to a button. That has also appeared on the loop deck in front of me. And if I press the button, it should run the program. I've now pressed it and 3D Mark should start shortly. There we go. Just a note, this is picking up information from your desktop. It may not work in all instances, depending on the type of EXE file that it is. For Microsoft Flight Simulator, flightsimulator.exe is a protected file. There is a workaround, but you probably won't need it. And now, before we load the Microsoft Flight Simulator profile, two other quick points that are worth noting. If you select one of the allocated buttons that are assigned, select the three dots, you get the option to create a custom action. So, for example, you could have it play a sound when that button was pressed. And lastly, understanding how pages work. It can be confusing. I'm currently on the Windows default profile. The leftmost button that looks like an on switch takes me home. To the front page, button 1 is switching to applications. That's what it's been designated at. But from the home button, I can extend the number of pages available by using touch pages. When these are available, it's indicated by the number shown, i.e. 2. So in this instance, I've just swiped across on the device physically and gone to the second page. If I press button 1, it takes me to application. Press home, it takes me home again. And once again, I can swipe. The easiest way to get your head around this is to think that your home screen actually has 24 icons or functions. They're just shown on two separate screens. Loop Deck Live comes with one Microsoft Flight Simulator default profile. To find it and load it, let's go to the Profiles tab and we're going to select Find More App Profiles. Click on that and it takes us to the marketplace. I'm aware this profile is a plugin, so we'll select that. We can now find it one of two ways. We can search and type in Microsoft Flight Simulator, but I know it's fairly near the top. There it is. And we'll select Install. My thanks to Calibex, the developer, for creating this profile. The profile is now currently being loaded and installed into the system. As you can see, it's a fairly quick process. Installation has succeeded. You may get this error message. Just ignore it. The profile will automatically be loaded back to our home screen, and there it is. As we could with the Windows default profile, we can add a profile, add an empty profile, or add a default profile as well. You'd create a duplicate if you didn't want to overwrite the default profile. One more thing I want to show you, back to Add More App Profiles, and this time we're going to select Icons. And we can see there's an icon pack for Microsoft Flight Sim 2020. If we select install, we'll get a sample of the icons downloaded for free, but it is a payware pack. We'll take a look at the few icons we get for free a little later on. And if you click on the icon pack, it will take you to the main icon web page. Here you can find out a little bit more about it. It offers 477 icons for Microsoft Flight Simulator. The cost? £20. You can also make your own icons by simply using a JPEG image. We'll be looking at that towards the end of the video. Our profile is now loaded. We can see that on the Loop Deck Live. And by selecting the Microsoft Flight Simulator icon on the right hand side, we're able to see what's available to us under the various folders. There are both button and rotary assignments given. This is not a fully comprehensive list for the sim, but it covers most of the basics. You should also note that not all the items are in the correct folders, or the folders where you'd expect them to be, so they're worth exploring. And it's also worth noting that these are the default assignments for the various actions. Any aircraft using bespoke assignments, well, these actions won't work. And we'll be tackling that issue later on in the video. Not all available functions on the right-hand side are within the default profile. Before going any further, it's important to note that this profile is hard-coded. What I mean by that is that it's programmed in C-sharp and not just keyboard shortcuts which you'd be able to edit. 
For clarity, you're able to mix and match the various functions as you require and create your own profiles from the various actions available. What you can't do is edit the actions themselves. Should you add any of your own actions to this profile, well, those actions would be editable. Well, I hope that makes sense. Among the various categories or directories available, there's one called Folder. And within the folder, there is Airliner, Autopilot, ATC and Lights. Within each one of these, there are multiple actions. They are folders within themselves. Due to the way that this folder has been put together, when you click on a directory such as Autopilot as shown on the LED buttons top left, the subdirectory is visible on the Loop Deck Live physically, but not within the software. The other restriction that applies to the folders is that some of the functions within the folders are not listed separately. That means they can only be selected by choosing the directory such as Autopilot, Airliner and so on. You can't pull them out and use them separately. Whilst Autopilot Lights and ATC are in the default profile, Airliner is not. So let's just quickly add that function. And we'll add it to Touch Page 2. So I'll add that just so that we can have a look at what's inside each of these folders. We'll go back and have a look at Autopilot first of all. On the Loop Deck Live, I click on that. Please excuse the quality of the photography. But now we can see what actions are available within the Autopilot folder. And in this case, they're all available individually as well. Back to our main menu and now let's choose lights. This is our light grouping and once again, they've all been listed separately so we can use these individually. Hitting the up arrow at the top takes us back to the main menu. Now ATC and this function simply open or closes the ATC menu. Page 2 is a touch page so I can just swipe across to page 2. There we are. And let's now choose Airliner. And whilst most of these are available, a few are not, such as FLC or Flight Level Climb, Approach and Lock. We can, of course, set these up individually ourselves using shortcut keys. So now that we understand the profile, let's have a play around. You may have noticed when we select Airliner, it had a different icon. That's because I went ahead and changed the icon earlier. When you select any button that has an assigned action, any editable elements will be shown in the lower right-hand menu. I've selected Airliner here. There's no action shown, so I can't edit that, but the icon is there, so I can change that. To do that, we click on the icon itself, and we get a number of options. One, choose something from the icon library, or I can browse on my PC and select an image from there. For this example, I'm going to choose the icon library, as we downloaded some icons earlier. These are some icons or images I have on my PC, but we downloaded the sample, the free samples, from the Icon City Microsoft Flight Simulator selection. This is what we get. I'm going to choose this icon as an example, hit save, and the icon is now there, and it's reflected on the Loop Deck Live as well. Let's now go and set up our own config for Microsoft Flight Simulator. To demonstrate just how easy and quick it is to create a profile, let's start from scratch. I've selected Microsoft Flight Simulator and I'm going to choose Add an Empty Profile. Give your profile a name so you can easily identify it and then select OK. We select this profile to make sure that it's the current one loaded. This is a blank profile, but it still has one or two default actions. We're now going to go ahead and delete those so that the profile is completely blank. Done. Now across to the right hand menu and we're going to select the Microsoft Flight Simulator logo. Open up the options there and I'm going to open up the folders so that we can see everything that we may want to select. As you can see, there's a fairly wide range of all the basic requirements that you may want to allocate to your aircraft. As mentioned previously, some of this is hard-coded, and some of the items are very useful indeed. This one, for example, is your RPM or N1 indicator. When in sim you start your engine, it'll burst into life. It's worth your while spending a bit of time with the menus to see exactly what's there. Right, let's try and put together a very simple configuration. Parking brake is one of the first things I check, so that can go on page one. It's a toggle function on and off, and when it's selected on, the bar underneath will light up green. 
Now selecting some lights. Navigation lights, also one of the first things I'll choose, so I drag and drop that onto one of the buttons. Now do the same for the beacon lights. Where is that beacon light? There it is. Drag it and simply drop it in place. And configuration is that easy. Let's allocate something now to one of the rotary buttons. Now I think for this example I'm going to choose flap. I select the rotary function, click with the mouse, hold it down and drag it over one of the rotary buttons. I can now increase or decrease flaps and there's also a button press to reset the flaps. Done. If you fill up the first page, well we can also add another page. Click Add New Page. Now we have Touch Page 2 available. Remember I can select anything from the right hand side. I'm going to select Loop Deck Device Actions, select Touch Page, Touch Page 2 which I've just created and drop that onto button number 1. So now I can select the Home button, it'll take me back to page 1, press button 1 and it takes me to page 2. Because it's a touch button, I can also physically on my device swipe from page to page. Let's carry on with our configuration and back to Microsoft Flight Simulator actions. I want to be able to set and adjust my barometer. For some strange reason that's under nav, but no problem. There it is, I'm going to select the rotary function as I want to put it on one of the dials. Left click on it, hold it down and drag it across. Release and it's done. I have two functions there. I can change the barrow by using the dial or press the button to reset the barometer. Well, I'm sure you get the gist by now. As shown earlier, you can export and save a profile. And what we're going to do now is load a profile that I created for myself earlier. I created a profile called MSFSGA. Select that and then import. No, I don't want to give it a new name. I'm happy with that name, so I'll select OK. And my new profile is now loaded. I get a quick message to say the import was successful. This is a simple profile I set up for myself. I've also taken advantage of using the folders for autopilot and lights, etc. And the functions or actions that I selected are over three pages. The rotary dial functions, however, remain static regardless of what page I'm on but I can equally create different pages for the rotary dials as well. So the number of configuration options are almost limitless. As far as I'm aware, nobody has developed a bespoke custom bridge between the Loop Deck Live and Microsoft Flight Simulator. If we take the Stream Deck for example, a bridge has been created, making configuration somewhat easier. But the Stream Deck doesn't have the functionality and the rotary dials that the Loop Deck Live does. So when you load up Microsoft Flight Simulator, it does not see the Loop Deck, which makes some configuration a little bit more difficult. However, the Loop Deck can do shortcuts, in effect record keyboard presses. So if an action is listed under the control options within Microsoft Flight Simulator, and there is a key combination for that action, or the action is listed but no key combination given, we can still configure it. Let's demonstrate this by using a simple example. In the Control Options menu of Microsoft Flight Simulator, we can see the Loop Deck is not recognized as a separate device. What I've done is made a copy of the default keyboard and called it Loop Deck. And I'll use this initially to configure the device. In the Search by Name box, I'm going to type in Autopilot. And here we can see there's a range of functions that have keystrokes allocated to them and some that don't. I'm now going to refine my search to Autopilot Heading. And here I find Heading Hold On and Autopilot Heading Hold Off don't have any keys allocated to them by default. So I'm going to use my own and then create a shortcut. Start with Heading Hold On. I'll select the Start Scanning box and I'll select the key combination I've chosen, which is Shift and Num7. If there was a conflict, I wouldn't use it. No conflict, so I can verify. Now let's set a default keyboard action for heading hold off. And in this case, I'm going to choose Shift and 1 on the numpad. No conflict, I can validate. These two functions are now actionable by keystrokes. If the action I wanted to configure to the loop deck already had a keystroke, I'd make a note of that and no need to create my own. So now let's head back to our loop deck software and set up a shortcut. I'm still on the profile that I set up, Microsoft Flight Simulator GA, and I've gone across to page 3, touch page 3, as I have space there, and on the right hand side under Loop Deck, 
I've chosen Select Shortcut. First of all, I'll give the shortcut a name. I'll call it Head On. And in the box below, I can now record my shortcut, which was Shift and 7 on the numpad. That's done. I can now go on and click Create. And as we can see, that shortcut is now selectable. That's done. Now back up to Shortcut. I want to create another one for heading off. Record the keystroke, which is Shift and 1 on the numpad. Give it a name, which I've called Heading Off, and Create. I now have Autopilot Heading Old on and off, and I can now drag and drop them across to the Loop Deck Live. I could select a different icon for each, but I won't bother on this occasion, as this is just an example. Let's go back to Sim and give it a test. I'm in the Cessna with the G1000, as it's easier to see. Now pressing Heading Hold On, and Heading shows on the primary display at the top. Let's now turn it off, and I get the ROL message, which is exactly correct. Let's try it a few times. Seems to be working very well. Response times seem fairly reasonable. OK, that works. Whilst we're here, let's try out a few other things. Now, putting the pito heat on and off. It's the green switch lower left. You can see it moving up and down as I touch the button on the Loop Deck Live. Now swipe back to my first page and I'm using elements from the default profile. Here we can see I'm getting a readout in RPM, altitude and fuel as well. I'm now going to advance the throttle and we should see things change. RPM has picked up 1700, 1800 RPM. We've started to move, so the speed gauge should be kicking in momentarily. There it goes. Now playing catch up. Now doing 11 knots, 12, and so on. Now that we've covered all that, let's have a look at a practical example. I'm now going to load another profile, one that I created separately. It's for the KAP 140 Autopilot. Just a simple page to replicate what's found on the KAP140. This is the Asobo standard autopilot you'll find in things such as the Cessna Skyline, an aircraft without the G1000 panels. To create the icons, I took a screen grab of the unit, then a screen grab of the individual buttons. To fill in the empty spaces, I've used some from the default Microsoft Flight Simulator profile, such as altitude and vertical speed. Very useful. In nearly all cases, I've simply recorded the necessary key presses or keystrokes required to feed that action in to Microsoft Flight Simulator. Let's test it out. We're in flight and the first step is to put the autopilot on, which I set as a button on the top rotary dial on the left. Now Alt on. Alt is 4300 feet. And now press the Nav button as of a short flight planned. We're in the UK, we're heading to Biggin Hill, just a little south of London. We're going to fly to a nav fix, Elkin, and shortly thereafter start an ILS approach, runway 21, Biggin Hill. The approach altitude for runway 21, Biggin Hill is 1,800 feet, so I need to plan my descent. And for that I'm going to use my VS button. You can see the Loop Deck Live is also recording 4,300 feet. And we can see it's 6 nautical miles to the next waypoint on the loop deck. So now on altitude I need to dial in the new altitude which is 1800 as mentioned before. And I'm turning the dial on the loop deck. There's 1800. And now I'm going to hit the VS button. The autopilot in sim records it. Now I'm rotating the VS dial. I'm going to plan for minus 800. You can see on the loop deck the dialed in 800 is shown under the VS as well as our actual descent in feet per minute. Don't want to overspeed, just coming back on the throttle a little bit so I can manage this descent. And my vertical speed gauge in sim is showing about 7800, that's fine. Now rotating the dial that controls the altitude, the barometer, I can change the pressure reading up and down, then tapping the barometer key and then pressing it a couple of times will reset it to the local pressure, which today coincidentally is 29.92, same as standard. To line up for the ILS, once I get to Alkin, I'm going to switch to heading mode to give me the offset I require for the ILS approach. So now just adjusting the heading. 
I want to fly just a small amount to the left of my current heading. There we are, set. We can see we're holding the nav track. We're descending at approximately 800 feet per minute to a planned altitude of 1,800 feet. All looking good so far. I've already set the frequency for my ALS approach runway 21 on my nav 1 which is 109.35 and my heading for the ILS will be 207 degrees. Now I've set that on my nav 1 as well. We're just past Alkin and continuing to follow the nav track so I'll hit the heading key and switch to heading mode and we can see the aircraft reacting immediately as it turns back now onto the heading track. I had planned to descend to 1,500 feet, but decided to halt at 1,800 hours further away from the airport than I expected. I'm preparing to engage the ILS, so I hit the approach key. Oh, and of course I need to hit the CDI button to change the mode to V-Lock. On the CAP 140 we can see approach mode is engaged, and the glide slope is indicating as well, with the letters GS. The aircraft is now correcting as I'm far too much to the left, but my altitude is about right as indicated. The autopilot is now starting a gradual descent, about 500 feet per minute, to keep me on the glide slope. According to the readout on the loop deck, I'm about 3 nautical miles away from the airport, just coming up on 1500 feet, once again managing my speed. Keeping an eye on our NAV1 vertical indicator, Runway is just ahead and we'd expect that to start moving across. The closer we get to the airport, the more sensitive it becomes. There it is, it's just starting to move now. And if all's working correctly, it should line me up with the runway, runway 21. Aircraft is holding me on the glide slope at the moment. So busy looking at the instruments, I'm not paying enough attention to my airspeed. That's got a little bit too low, need to increase the throttle a bit. Ideally at this point we should be approaching at between 80 and 90 knots. Flaps all the way down. The bar is now centralised and we can see the aircraft now lining up for the runway. Slightly high on the glide slope, but it should correct that, a Sobo programming allowing. So overall, the CAP 140 seems to be operating effectively. It's not perfect, but it'll do for now. If you're still with me, well done. So far, we've learned how to use the Loop Deck Live software. We've downloaded the default Microsoft Flight Simulator profile, and using that profile, we're able to change and configure it to suit our needs. We've also learned how to add in additional elements that are not within the default profile, providing that action is shown within the Control Options menu. But what happens if that function is not within the Control Options menu? Or perhaps you're using a bespoke aircraft with a bespoke configuration. Well, the good news is you can still configure the Loop Deck Live, but you need to use third-party software. And in the final part of this video, let's now have a look at that software and the implications thereof. The Loop Deck Live is no different to any other flight sim peripheral. When it comes to more complex programming, identifying bespoke inputs, and especially programming those controls that are conditional on other elements. You need to rely on third-party applications or software. In flight simulation, these have been around for many years, such as FSUIPC and SPADNEXT. SPADNEXT, for example, is a very powerful program. It will allow you to interrogate what actions buttons are being pressed within the sim, or what buttons are being pressed on your device and allocate specific actions and conditions to those button presses, etc. Utilizing SPADNEXT, for example, there's very little you couldn't program. And SPADNEXT has an arsenal of different ways it can identify inputs. For the Loop Deck Live, for example, it would identify it as a MIDI device. Yes, that's sound. But why not? Because that's still just another electrical pulse being sent through to the sim. SPAD next is Payware. The standard edition, which most of you will use, will cost £25 or something close to that. And the Microsoft Flight Simulator edition covers prepared as well. There's a separate version for X-Plane. Today we've focused on Microsoft Flight Simulator, but the Loop Deck device could be used with any sim. The principles are the same, but the default profile is Microsoft Flight Simulator only. 
Spadnext also offer a complete edition that'll cost nearly 90 euros or something in the region of about 85 pounds. It combines X-Plane and Microsoft Flight Simulator support, but also importantly, includes voice. And this may be important to anybody flying VR. What I mean by that is that when you press a button, say heading, you can program it so it would say heading, or autopilot on, autopilot off, gear up, gear down, and so on. It is beyond the scope of this video to cover the programming in SPAD Next. That is a complete subject on its own. There is, however, a wealth of information available on SPAD Next, including detailed tutorial videos, a very active Discord with very helpful members, and if you do get SPAD Next, I do recommend joining the Discord. They have a section called Snippets, and members post their programs there for others to download. The loop deck is relatively new, so there's very little available at this time. Having set up a profile in Loop Deck Live based on MIDI outputs, we can see above here they're identified by SPAD Next, and we can allocate actions to them. To configure the device as a MIDI device, we get two options, a MIDI action and a dial adjustment. The MIDI action, let's look at that first, that's a button press. We can quickly just give it a name, we'll call it button 1. Just as an example, we have a number of options, but we want it to be note play. We want it to send an electrical impulse using the note C0. There's a massive range of different notes to choose from. We can set up the various parameters as required and then save it. And we now have a button that we can allocate that Spadnix can identify. We can do the same with a dial adjustment, so that our rotary dials are recognized. Default is program change, but we want to change that to CC set. That allows the identification as a wheel or lever, in our case a wheel. We can complete the rest of the various parameters and then save it. We now have a rotary dial based on MIDI output. And just as before, we can allocate them to various buttons or dials, or both depending on what it is. Button 1 is now allocated, so is dial 1, but the dials can act as buttons, so I could allocate that there as well. When configuring buttons, obviously each button would be a different note. But again, this would be a subject for another video. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, the Loop Deck Live, well, it's a stream deck on steroids. The big advantage, in my personal opinion, are the six rotary dials, which can also be programmable as buttons. As for its use in Microsoft Flight Simulator, well, it can appeal to a variety of different users. For those happy with just the basic profile, as we demonstrated, you can mix and match to your heart's content. For those wanting to take it one step further, well, we can use the shortcut function and build in additional actions not within the default profile. I had a look on the flightsim.com website and there is one profile there already. It seems to cover a lot of actions but I haven't tried it so I just can't recommend it at this time. And for those that want even more, well there's the pro sim option of using SPAD Next. I need to brush up on my SPAD Next programming, haven't used it since my prepared days. And it's exciting to think what the community can create. Maybe an autopilot on one page, the Garmin 530 on another, and the G1000 on another. Who knows? In addition to the device's flexibility and versatility, I like the quality of the product. And for flight simming, well, the size is just right. The software is fairly intuitive and easy to use once you've spent a bit of time and got familiar with the interface. So as you've probably gathered by now and by the length of this video, I do like this product. And going forwards, it'll form an integral part of my flight sim setup. It'll be interesting to see what we can do with the likes of the 737 from PMDG and Aerosoft CRJ. Do I recommend the product? Yes, I do. Is it right for you? Well, that's a decision you have to make. And it's one of the reasons I've gone into so much detail to show you the product, so that you can make an informed choice. There's not really a long list of negatives. I haven't measured the cable, I think it's something around a meter, but I would prefer something a bit longer. With the Loop Deck Live being fairly new in the market, not a lot of profiles exist, but I hope that that would change over time, just as it did with the Stream Deck. And lastly, 
my thanks to you for watching the video and to LoopDeck for providing me with a unit for review purposes. It's a product that deserves a lot more airtime. Thank you very much for joining me today. Look after yourself, stay well. I'll see you again soon and bye-bye for now.